Okay, here's a little trick for you when it comes to your exams. You might see a question where you're given the height that something falls. You can bet your bottom dollar that you're gonna have to use conservation of energy. In other words, the amount of GP that it has is gonna be equal to the amount of KE that it has when it hits the floor. And I'm gonna put a little caveat in here, unless it's projectile motion. So if you have a bungee jumper here and you're told how far they drop before the bungee cord gets taut, first of all, you might be asked to find out what is the GPE? GPE is equal to MGH, that's mass times gravitational field strength, that's 9.81, times the height that something falls. If you want to be super accurate, technically we're asking what is the change in gravitational potential energy, and therefore it's going to be mg delta h, but it doesn't matter really when it comes to the answer. So let's say that this person has a mass of 50 kilograms, and they're falling a height of 10 meters. Therefore, GPE is going to be equal to m50 times g, 9.81, times height, that's 10. That's 4,905 joules. You see this come up in GCSE a lot, but it also comes up in A-level. But A-level physicists, if you think that this is a bit too easy, don't worry, we're gonna look at some harder stuff in a minute. But then chances are what you're gonna to have to do is calculate what is speed at the bottom. And sometimes people think that when a ball hits the ground, its end speed is zero. Oh, because it's stationary. Nope. If we're asked to calculate the speed at the end, we're asked to calculate the speed at which it hits the ground, not what it is after a couple of seconds on the ground. So we know that this is going to be equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom because it's lost all that GPE and it's gained that much kinetic energy. We know that this is equal to half mv squared. We're trying to find v. So let's rearrange to find v squared. So let's just write this out again. E just calling it E for now, we know it's energy, we know it's kinetic energy, e equals half mv squared. In order to get rid of a half, we double the whole thing. And in order to get rid of the mass, we're multiplying by it right now, so we divide by it on the other side. We have v squared equals 2e over m. Therefore, v by itself is going to be equal to the square root of two lots of the energy divided by the mass. So it's going to be 2 times that 4905 divided by 50. And that gives me 14.0 meters per second. But there is a shortcut. If you want to find the speed, you don't need the mass. If we know that GP is going to be equal to KE, we can say that MGH is equal to half MV squared. What do we see in both? We see an M on both sides. Therefore, all we have to do is rearrange to find V again. Let's take the half over the other side. That's 2GH equal to V squared. Therefore, if you haven't seen this sign before, it's just three dots means therefore. Therefore, the speed is going to be equal to the square root of 2gh. Now you might notice that this is actually just a rearranging of Newton's equation of motion. v squared equals u squared plus 2as. So whether you come from that angle or whether you come from energy, you always end up with v is equal to square root of 2 times acceleration due to gravity, also known as gravitational field strength, times the distance moved. In this case, it's height. So let's just check to see if that's correct. Square root of two times 9.81 times 10. Lo and behold, it is 14 meters per second. So it just goes to show that mass does not affect how fast something is going to hit the ground with when it falls. And you should know this to be true. If you drop a football and if you drop a ball bearing from the same height, they should reach the ground at the same time, at least in a vacuum. But it's pretty much the same time in air as well. Mass is not in this equation. This is more for A-level people, but it could crop up in GCSE as well. What if you're given a ramp like this? But you're not given the angle, but you are given the height of the ramp. Again, we're gonna to have to use GPE equals KE. And the exact same thing applies. This trolley that's on here will fall down and the kinetic energy that it has at the end is gonna be equal to the GPE at the start. So again, we can say, mgh is equal to half mv squared. But there is a possibility that energy is lost, and that's usually due to friction. Yeah, it could be air resistance as well, but let's say frictional forces. So you could get asked how much energy is lost. So of course, this is gonna be equal to GPE, take away the kinetic energy at the bottom. When we say lost energy, we mean like energy transferred to surroundings, because I know that, Oh, people get very hot up about that nowadays. We know what that means. 
So let's say that we find that we have 50 joules at the top of GPE, but we only end up with 40 joules of kinetic energy at the bottom. We have 10 joules of lost energy due to frictional forces. Now this probably is for A-level people. What you could get asked then is, what is the size of frictional force? Well, we know that this energy lost is going to be the same as work done against friction. So we can say that's equal to F times D, where D is the actual length of the ramp. One more for A-level people. This is a classic one. If you give it a pendulum, and we're not told how far it swings, all we're told is how much higher the pendulum is at amplitude compared to at equilibrium. Again, we know we're going to have to use mgh equals half mv squared. And then we find v. v can then be used, and actually it's going to be v max, isn't it? Because that's the speed at which it goes through equilibrium with. v max then can then be used to find the amplitude because as hopefully you know, V max is equal to 2 pi F A. So there we go. If you're given height in an exam question, 95% of the time you're going to have to use the idea of GPE and KE, gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. If there's no energy lost, then they're going to be the same and we can use our shortcut. But if we want to find the energy that's lost, all you have to do is find the difference between the two. So I hope you find this helpful. If you did, then please leave a like. If you have any questions or suggestions as to what I can do next, tip-wise, then put them down below in a comment. See you next time.